What's in your head is just as important as what's on your plate. You get to be in control of how other people show up in your life. It is pretty easy if you're prepared. And I think being prepared is the key. Hi everyone, it's Greta from the Yummy Yummer Cookbook and welcome to my kitchen. Today I have invited several WW members in because they said they would do my dishes and my laundry, right? Is that what you said? That's what you said, right? Actually, we're here to do a Q&A with questions submitted by WW members. So let's get started. So Donna asks, what are some great alternatives for using cream in recipes? So that depends. Are you using the cream to try to make the recipe lighter, lighter in fat and calories, or are you using the cream because you're lactose intolerant or maybe can't have dairy? So let's start with the first one to make the recipe lighter. So if a soup recipe, for example, says to add half a cup of heavy cream at the end to make it creamier, it's probably a pureed soup or some kind of chowder. You can go all the way down to 5% cream and it'll still taste really good. In fact, unless the recipe called for whipping cream, I bet you wouldn't even know the difference. The other thing you can use in place of heavy cream to make it lighter is something like Greek yogurt. Uh, a soup recipe is another great example of where you would stir that in at the end. You have to be a little bit careful not to overheat recipes that use Greek yogurt because it can curdle and separate. So obviously you don't want that to happen. And then the final ingredient that I use instead of cream, and a lot of you will know this, because the last time I did a video segment with you, so many people said that the chicken pot pie chowder in Yum and Yummer Cookbook was one of their most favorite recipes ever. Do you remember what that uses instead of cream? It uses evaporated 2% milk, which really should be called concentrated 2% milk. It's not really evaporated. Evaporated makes it sound like you open the can and there's nothing there. It's really milk that has been simmered and concentrated, which makes it stronger in flavor. Because if you use regular 2% milk, it's probably going to be a bit of a disappointment. Now, when it comes to using cream alternatives because you're lactose intolerant or because you can't have dairy, way more challenging. I find this all the time. So just yesterday I went to the grocery store and I looked at all the Greek yogurt or yogurt alternatives that were non-dairy, blown away by how many choices there were because it used to just be um, soy. Then coconut yogurt came along. Now they have oat, cashew, and almond yogurt. So not all of those are going to work though, depending on what you need it for. If I was making banana bread, for example, Banana bread might have a cup of Greek yogurt in it. Oh, I can't have the dairy. What kind of non-dairy yogurt would you use? I think that's an example of where flavor like coconut would actually work in a banana bread, right? But you don't want to take a flavor that would compete with the banana or make it taste off in that recipe. Also, the coconut yogurt tends to be nice and thick, where some of the other ones, I find them to be really uh, runny. There's also, you know, if it comes to not a, a yogurt replacement, but a cream replacement that's non-dairy, have you seen the new oat milk creamer? So a lot of people are using oat milk in their cereal, comes in sort of that Tetra box, some of them um, refrigerated, but now they make it in a creamer form. So it's for your coffee. So that's what I would choose to replace cream in, for example, a soup recipe is the one that's a little bit thicker and more concentrated rather than standard oat milk or almond milk, which I find to be extremely watery texture. But you can make your own almond milk and I have a recipe in Yum and Yummer and you'll love it. One of our members, Vicki asks, what is your favorite herb combination for fish? Um, for fish, I would divide it into two categories. So to me, it depends on whether it's the light white flakier fish or if it's a heavier fish like salmon. So for the lighter flakier fish like cod, for example, it's almost flavorless. So you really have to jazz it up. So I love to use fresh basil for that in a combination with tomatoes and onions, and you can saute all that together. I created a recipe for yum and yummer that a lot of people know. It's called 15 minute Mediterranean fish dish. You literally have it on the table in 15 minutes and you make um, a tomato almost like a bruschetta but it's hot. And then at the very end, you throw a little bit of feta cheese into it with the fresh basil and the tomatoes and put it on the fish. And it looks like a gourmet meal, but honestly, it takes 15 minutes. And then the other herb that I, probably my personal favorite that I use the most is fresh dill. So a lot of people say to me, I don't like dill that much or dill's kind of strong. Mm -hmm. 
I think that's probably because they had dill raw and not cooked because dill raw is very strong. Dill cooked is a lot milder. So with the fish, you're going to cook it. And I did a recipe for whole roasted salmon filet and it's with a marinade and it is with maple syrup, lots of lemon, Dijon mustard, a little bit of balsamic vinegar and fresh dill. So yeah, if you drank that out of a wine glass, the dill would probably taste pretty strong. But when you pour it over a piece of salmon and roast it in the oven, honestly, it is so good. The issue with that recipe is it's hard to stop eating it. So I would say fresh basil and dill would be the two herbs I would use for fish. So Greta, Darlene asks, how do you make prepping and preparing healthy foods look so easy for fun? <laughs> well, actually it is pretty easy if you're prepared. And I think being prepared is the key. You need uh, to read the entire recipe from start to finish before you do anything. Because I have had people write to me and say, I wanted to make your marinated yada yada for dinner. And I didn't realize until I got to the end that it said marinate overnight, my company was coming in an hour. So you don't want that to happen. So read the recipe from start to finish. Also get your ingredients out, get them all on the counter, make sure you have everything and whatever you need to prep in advance, prep in advance. So great example, you're making like a Thai stir fry. You don't want to be adding the ingredients to the wok and then go, okay, now I need the red peppers. Meanwhile, that's burning. You want to have everything all cut already on a cutting board. So you can just add, add, add. So it's mostly um, about preparation, but in sort of a bigger picture of cooking in general, healthy or unhealthy, <laughs> you need the right tools. So questions that I get all the time, things like what kind of pots and pans do you use? Well, I don't really have a brand that I stick to. To me, it's more about the function of it and the types of pots and pans that you need in order to make any type of recipe. So let me show you my number one pot, for example. Um, I've had this pot, so it's a cast iron pot, and I've had this pot for 14 years, okay? It still functions like it's brand new. Yes, these pots are really expensive. This pot probably costs 300 bucks. But divided by 14 years, what's that, $25 a year to have this pot? If you're the type of person that makes soup, stew, or chili, which I highly recommend all of those <laughs> for healthy eating, having this pot is a godsend. I absolutely love it. And it's amazing how easily it cleans up and I like the way it cooks. So there are a whole bunch of different brands of this type of pot, but they are about $300, but you're gonna, you're gonna keep them forever. You might even pass them down to your kids, okay? So when it comes to other um, pots, you obviously need smaller like saucepans, uh, something that you would boil spaghetti in or corn on the cob, something a little bit bigger. And then just sort of a medium sized pot that you would use for like boiling carrots or potatoes. So maybe like four or five pots total. Uh, you could use stainless steel or you could use nonstick. I use stainless steel, but I use nonstick for my frying pans. So let me give you an example. I have two frying pans. Uh, or skillets, I guess you would call them, that I use. And they're the only two I use, even though I have many more, which I used for food photography. I find myself going into my drawer to get the same two. This size and this size. <laughs> so I got a little one for when I'm making poached eggs for myself and I only want two eggs. And then I've got one that's about 10 inches. So I could do um, a lot bigger. Like let's say I'm um, searing chicken or something like that. And I need to fit a bunch of chicken breasts. So that's basically it for my cookware for the ones that I use the most. And then the other thing that you need is a good set of knives. So a lot of people think that you have to spend a thousand dollars for a good set of knives. You can spend a thousand dollars on a good set of knives, but you don't need to. What you need to do is find knives that are one sharp. If they're not sharp, surprisingly, you're actually going to end up cutting yourself because you're going to go to cut a sweet potato and it's going to slip and cut your thumb. Done it. Um, you need knives that feel good in your hands. Same with pots and pans, by the way. I've tried some really high-end brands of pots and pans, and I hate the way that handle feels in my hand, especially when it's heavy, so I can't use them. A knife should feel good in your hands. So good set of pots and pans, good set of knives, and of course, if you want to cook, healthy cooking, you need spices because spices are where you're going to get all of your flavor. You don't need a hundred spices like I have in my spice drawer. You probably need 10 to 12 of the basics. Um, I could rattle off my favorites, uh, things like chili powder, ground cumin, because you got to make chili, 
uh, oregano and basil, rosemary, thyme, of course. Um, and then for baking and warmth, uh, cinnamon. Couldn't live without cinnamon. Put it in my baking, put it in my oatmeal. Um, a little tip for people that love a hint of cinnamon in their coffee and want a natural sweetener in their coffee because I'm a coffee girl. I bought a small uh, jar of maple syrup, put it in my smallest pot and stove with a couple of cinnamon sticks and you just let it simmer a little bit and then get rid of your cinnamon sticks. Put the maple syrup in a little container in your fridge and it's like you have homemade syrup like from you know, the fancy chain, <laughs> except you made it homemade with maple syrup and cinnamon, put a drizzle of that in your coffee, it's so good. So there you go. Awesome. Thank you. So I love to bake, but you know, sometimes I have this loaf and it's cooked on the outside, but in the middle it's raw. What can I be doing and what can I do to fix that? You know what? I hear that question all the time. People struggle to bake a loaf and there could be several reasons for that. One of the reasons is the pan that you're using is too small, right? Mm -hmm. So there's basically nine by five pans and eight by four pans. Sometimes it's nine and a half by five and a half, sometimes eight and a half by four and a half. But if a recipe is for the bigger pan and you only have the smaller pan and you're like, I'm gonna put it in the smaller pan anyway, what happens is your smaller eight by four loaf pan is full before you even get it into the oven. So now imagine the batter in that pan with the heat trying to grow right? It has nowhere to go because it needs the sides of the pan a little bit to help it. People don't really realize that the leavening, it's almost like it needs the support a little bit of the pan to grow. And then the rest whoosh, goes from there and you get the nice. But if you're starting it full, you're going to struggle to get that thing to bake. Not only is it going to be wet on the inside, burned on the outside, but it's going to be flat because it didn't have the ability to grow in that pan that was too small. So using the proper size pan is key. On the opposite, if your recipe calls for an eight by four loaf and you only have a nine by five, you're okay because it's gonna have plenty of room to grow. It's just gonna be shorter, right? Because it's not gonna be as full. So you're gonna have a shorter loaf. You probably have to reduce your cooking time by about 10 minutes too, because the more space it has, the faster it grows, the faster it bakes. The other problem, in baking with a loaf is that when I hear that when people say, oh, the inside didn't quite cook and then they did use the right loaf pan. So it's not that problem. It sounds to me like their batter is too wet. So sometimes you accidentally have too much liquid. Oftentimes people make a substitution in baking and baking is science. So you can end up with too much liquid. You know what else causes too much liquid in a loaf? Using frozen bananas instead of fresh bananas. And people use frozen bananas all the time in banana bread, for example. Nothing wrong with that, they have great flavor, but it's gonna make the batter wetter. If you take a frozen banana out of the freezer, put it on a plate and let it thaw, there'll be water all around it, right? And then think of one that you just peeled and you mashed, it doesn't have that. Zucchini is a popular ingredient used in loaves. You really need to squeeze that dry. So when you grate it, it has such high water content that it really needs to be squeezed or dried even with paper towels as much as you can before you put it into your chocolate zucchini loaf. Otherwise, it's gonna to be too wet. And the inside just can't cook um, when the batter doesn't have sort of the same strength because it's too runny. And the very last point I would say is check your oven temperature. People think ovens are all perfect, even if they're going, oh, I just got a new oven. Spend 10 bucks on a little oven thermometer and test it. So when it beeps and tells you at 375, is it? Or is it at 350? Or is it at 425? Ovens are notoriously inaccurate. So check for your oven temperature. If you've got the right pan and your ingredients aren't too wet and your oven temperature's right, your loaf should be perfect. And my final tip about loaves is just make muffins. It's way easier. It's the same recipe. So if you struggle with loaves, take the batter and put it in 12 muffins. Probably takes 18, 20 minutes to bake and you're done versus an hour. Versus an hour. So does that help? Oh, that's amazing. That is so helpful. Greta, what are some of your favorite seasonal recipes? Um, you know, fall cooking is probably my favorite because it uses a lot of the warm spices and it includes things like soup and chili and stew. And I love one pot cooking right? Those are also recipes that double well. So if you're making one pot for dinner tonight, have another pot on the go and then freeze it. 
Those recipes usually freeze really well too. But I always tell people that chili to me is one of what's one of my favorite things to eat, but it's also one of the healthiest meals you can eat. Why? Because it has lean protein, it has fiber from beans, and it has all those vegetables and spices. It's basically everything you would want in a meal, in one bowl, in one pot. Also, who doesn't know how to make chili? Everybody knows how to make chili. It's a little bit of chopping, slicing and dicing, but it's worth it. And you can do with meat or you could do vegetarian. So for example, I do one with lentils and lentils are a great substitute for meat in a recipe like that because when you use the brown lentils, like I just used the ones in the can, they're actually little bits that end up kind of mimicking like little bits of ground beef but they also are really high in protein and they're really filling and satisfying. Mm. And then another combination that I really like is a sweet potato and black bean chili. And I throw a little bit of kale or spinach in it. So it's very beautiful looking, it's very flavorful. So for someone that's vegan, that is a really good way uh, to do it and still have sort of the, the heartiness of it. So we had a, an email from a single guy who was asking about how to best do prep meals for the week when you just cook and just pour water. Cooking for one can be a bit of a challenge, especially if you don't like leftovers. I personally love them <laughs> because it's stress-free free dinner, right? But not everybody wants to eat the same thing over and over again. And most recipes are not for one. And the thing is, most uh, ingredients that you buy aren't portioned for one either. So you're gonna end up with a whole bunch of extra food. But this is where I think like your freezer comes into play because I try to look for meals that I can make and then heat up on an individual basis. So instead of making something for eight, I eat my dinner and I freeze the rest. I'm doing it the opposite way. I'm making something big and I'm freezing it in individual portions so that I can take out only what I want, right? So that makes sense. And something that people don't think of to do with that is marinate meat or let's say chicken, for example. So recipe makes six pieces and you make it and then you got leftovers in the fridge, which you have to eat by a certain day or they're gonna go bad. So what I say is take your six pieces of chicken and the marinade, put it in a Ziploc, mix it all up so it's nice, and then stick it in the freezer. And then you can just take out what you want to cook. So if you want two pieces, you just take out two and they're already marinated and taste amazing. And the rest can sit there for months. I mean, think about it. If you made it the whole recipe and put it in the fridge, it would be a few days before it would go bad. And other recipes that are great to do like that, that I do in big batches, like a homemade pasta sauce, right? And again, you can do that with meat or you can do it with lentils. You can make it vegetarian. You can use ground beef, turkey, whatever. Chili, another great example of something you can make in a big pot, but then freeze it in individual portions and put it in your freezer. So that when it's time to eat, all you're doing is reheating and you don't have to do the big production. So that would probably be my biggest tip for someone who's single is to kind of think the opposite of what we normally do, right? Freeze it first, then eat what you want, as opposed to having all these leftovers that go into your fridge and that spoil. So Greta, you kind of talked about this already a little bit, and that is um, when you want your recipes to be a little lighter, like mm -hmm. fewer points, for instance, um, what are some of the biggest tips that you have in terms of um, lightening up? your recipes in general? Well, you don't want to lighten up the flavor, yeah. right? So I know I touched briefly on spices and flavorings, and that's really the key is getting comfortable with using spices and also choosing recipes that naturally have more flavor, right? So if you're going to cook and you're going to make a stir fry, maybe like try something new, like a Thai red curry chicken or something that might have a lot of flavor because when things have way more flavor and taste delicious, it sounds like um, this is contradictory, but you actually end up eating a bit less because it's so satisfying. And then, you know, recipes with sugar, you can really cut back on the amount of sugar without noticing that much of a difference. So for example, if you're making muffins that have a cup of sugar, even just going to three quarters of a cup, and eventually you're probably gonna be able to get that down to a half by substituting things that are naturally sweet. So for example, if you're making banana muffins, your bananas need to be extra, extra ripe so that you can use less sugar and have more natural sugar. So there's just a few ideas that I have.
That reminds me of, um, there's a recipe that you have in here for butternut squash soup, and you mm -hmm. insist that your butternut squash needs to be roasted first. Yes. Does this kind of tie into the whole flavor thing? For sure, because butternut squash, actually many vegetables in the squash family are pretty bland. So how do you jack up the flavor without having to slather them in butter and maple syrup? <laughs> the butter and maple syrup <laughs> and butter maple syrup and cinnamon yes. <laughs> that wouldn't be that bad but roasting vegetables brings out their flavor i roast everything okay roast the squash get those little caramelized bits taste so good roast sweet potatoes roast brussels sprouts i love roasted cauliflower people always say i don't like cauliflower it's because you had boiled mash yucky cauliflower try roasting it it's really really good that's a great tip that's a great tip. She knows what she's talking about. <laughs> Yum and yummer too. Right here. <laughs> you know, I'm thinking about the holidays coming up and there's always this dessert, something that's very decadent, but do you have anything that would be enjoyable and not be in not have so many points? Um, there are always lighter dessert recipes, right? And I always include dessert recipes in my cookbook. So for example, a cheesecake where I would use something like light cream cheese or even pureed cottage cheese is a good substitute for cream cheese in a cheesecake. Mm. But I believe certain times and certain occasions should be labeled as splurge worthy, right? It's your mm -hmm. birthday and you want a piece of high fat cheesecake enjoy every mouthful of it and get right back on track the next day. So I feel like a few times a year, whether it's a holiday or your birthday or someone's anniversary or a special dinner that you're out for, that might be the time to go, you know what, I'm just gonna have this piece. I'm gonna enjoy every mouthful of it. And often when we have a dessert that, let's say it is some chocolate lava cake at the restaurant, it's the, usually the first couple bites of that that are the most satisfying. But what do we do? We just keep eating it because it's there on our plate and because we paid for it. So I usually share it with someone. You want to split the chocolate lava cake with me? She does, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. And then you both you both can have half of it. You know what? You had dessert. It was delicious. You loved it. It wouldn't be as many points that way, but you got the satisfaction of eating it. So I always remember splurge worthy in the back of my mind that if I'm going to have a dessert, better be worth it. I don't want some lamb cheat cake for grandma and grandpa's 75th anniversary that doesn't taste like anything and then they give you a piece of steak and you eat it, right? I'd rather have a smaller bite of something that's like super worth it. I got lots of nods from this. Oh, yes, yes. Yeah. agreeing <laughs> with me. <laughs> Fred, I have this question about cheese because cheese, we love it in our family. We love brie. We love slathering it on baguettes, but you know, can there be too much cheese? What <laughs> suggestions do you have? Or what kind of recipes can we incorporate uh, cheese that, uh, you know, being on WW, I just want to be able to stay on track. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I love cheese. So when I have cheese, I tend to buy cheese that's stronger because I feel like I get more out of it when I'm eating it, right? So like an aged cheddar versus a mild one. You have mild cheddar, it's like, what am I even eating, right? But then you have the aged cheddar and you're like, cheese. Right? Parmesan, Romano, Asiago, all those very strong flavors. So if you're having a pasta dish, you want to put a little sprinkle of a really strong cheese on it because it gives you more, sort of more bang for the buck. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. And that helps me to eat a little bit less. Those like cheese string things, no flavor. I can eat nine of them so I don't buy them, right? Because I can't get the satisfaction from it. So again, flavor is kind of key with healthy eating, right? If it tastes good, and it makes you smile, you're probably going to eat a little bit less of it. So today we talked a lot about uh, fall seasonal recipes and recipes including pumpkin. And pumpkin is an ingredient that I like to sneak into food as well to add more nutrition. Where can you use canned pumpkin? Well, it tastes really good with vanilla protein powder and cinnamon in a smoothie. Almost tastes like pumpkin pie. That's a good way to sneak it in and get some nutrition. I also put leftover canned pumpkin into chili about a cup of it and a pot of chili, all it does is make it silky smooth instead of uh, brothy and makes it seem a little bit richer and more filling and adds a little bit more nutrition to it. Um, and you can freeze canned pumpkin and a lot of people don't realize that. But lately a dilemma that has been coming up for people is panic 
emailing me, you're not going to believe it. I was supposed to buy canned pure pumpkin. I bought pumpkin pie filling. What is the difference? What do I do now? So pumpkin pie filling has sugar and spices in it already. So for recipes that are calling for canned pure pumpkin, you really don't want that. But don't forget, you can freeze it and you could use that in the smoothie. You could use that in muffins because it's going to have the right flavor. Uh, so you don't need to throw it out. But check this out. One moment, please. Am I the only person that I've never noticed this before? So it's easy to make the mistake of pure pumpkin versus pumpkin pie filling. This brand, which is obviously the one everyone knows it's the most popular, on the pumpkin pie filling, they show pumpkin pie. On the pure pumpkin, they show a pumpkin. We should not be making this mistake. If you're making a pie, here's the pie. You need pure pumpkin, it's a pumpkin. I did not notice this until about a week ago. So that's my little tip I'm sharing with you. I cannot speak for any other brands, but for this one, pie, pure pumpkin. Well, that was fun. Thanks for joining me in my kitchen. I really like answering your questions. So keep them coming. If you wanna follow me on Instagram, I'm at yum and yummer. Be well, and I hope to chat with you again soon.